one of us trying to harness in one way or the other in order to express the world view that we imagine in our minds. So, I'm going to ask Dr. Chambonka to please come forward without preempting what he's going to do. But as I listen to him, I hope I'm going to hear something about his philosophy, his view of the world, what he believed, what he did not believe, as well as how maybe we can <coughs> tap into who he was in order to form a community and a society that we do. Thank you very much. Um, I prefer that I will meet you later. I just want to get into the meat of the business of the day. We will find time for meetings uh, at the end of my presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, the title of my talk today is um, Joshua on the Cross, the Crucifixion of the Philosopher of Liberation. Um, <clears throat> what am I talking about? Uh, I will begin with salutations and a certain introduction. Um, I deposit my salutations to the, the Joshua Nkomo Foundation in South Africa for affording me the opportunity to reflect on a great African statesman, not Zimbabwean statesman. Uh, I want to submit my intention to reflect on the values and not the person of Joshua Nkomo. It is only a philosophical dilemma that personal values cannot be reflected upon without reference to the person that hears those values. I want to confess my personal vulnerability to the strong temptation to be carried away by my enchantment with the, the heroism of Joshua Hall. But I want to promise that I will not allow my enchantment to overtake candid uh, observation. I want to confess my deep suspicion of heroes um, in their religious sense or political goals. Why? Because if there were no heroes in politics, especially, there would be no traitors. Once a struggle is a hero, the process of betraying that struggle has begun. I want to declare my belief that to liberate Gomo which is the theme of this commemorative event, we must recover the name and the image of Joshua Nkomo from myths and fictions. Myths and fictions created both by his diehard supporters and his own enemies. We want to locate the Joshua Nkomo of actuality away from folk tales, legends, myths, propaganda, and other imagination. Right, um, going back to the title of my talk, Joshua on the Cross, the Crucifixion of the Philosopher of Liberation. But who fundamentally are the philosophers of liberation? Because if there is a philosopher of liberation, Joshua Nkomo would not have been the first one or the last one. I'm trying to map out the characteristics of these so called philosophers of liberation. Those of you that have appetite for studying and reading, um, I can refer you to Gustavo Guitares on uh, liberation theology, Paulo Freire on humanism, and Ricky Husserl on um, the philosophers of liberation. These are scholars that have written on liberation thinking, liberation philosophy. So there's a type of thinkers that are called liberation I will try and talk about them. Because they are great individuals, they have got great strengths, and they are good people, I am not going to concentrate on their greatness. Because it is obvious. I will talk about some of their limitations, which we need to, to understand. What uh, Dr. Andrew was saying, that what are we here to do? Are we here to praise Joshua Komo? Are we here to criticize Joshua Komo? I think we are here to understand Joshua Komo and how 
we can base on his philosophy and his legacy, pick up pieces of the future by looking at um, the past. Like I said before, this kind of philosopher called the philosopher of liberation is a great individual. These are great and rare human beings who love liberation and fear domination. Nelson Mandela, Oliver Tamlin, Samora Matel, at least. Samora Matel was more of a soldier. <coughs> then many others, they will come as I got These are great and rare human beings who love liberation and fear domination. What you are talking about, uh, Dr. Andrew, that Ngomo enchanted people. Some of the people don't know why they were enchanted by Ngomo. That's one quality. Greatness. Just being great. Because their greatness is obvious, I said, I intend to talk only about their weaknesses and limitations. They are great humanists. <coughs> so they very easily forget that there are animals among humans. Especially in politics. Because these individuals are great, they forget that there are other people who are not great, who are animals in politics, especially. Trusting their enemies more than their friends. They take advice from enemies sometimes. Joshua Gomo is friends. Zaku is friends. Zipa is friends. Cuba. Russia. Um, Angola. But eventually, when it came to making critical decisions, Joshua Nkomo listened to Nyerere, the British and the Americans. Yet he says here that Nyerere had a personal contempt for me and did not want me in power. And Nyerere, as a, a member of the front line states, told Carrington that if Robert Mugabe loses the election in 1980, we are going back to war. After Mugabe was met to win, Nyerere sent a messenger to Carrington to say thank you very much for permitting Mugabe to win, but why did you make him win so much? <laughs> Nyerere kicked Ngomo out of Tanzania twice. He said, get away of here, you are not a leader, you are not supposed to be here anymore. And ceremonies. But when it came to making a critical decision that I will come to, these great humanists are like that. So they easily forget that they are animals among humans, especially in politics, trusting their enemies more than their friends, and eventually taking advice from enemies who got bad and evil designs. They fear war and death, therefore prepare dialogue to arm strike. They frequently disarm their soldiers and prevent rather than enable military victory. You can talk about South Africa here. Um, there's a camp where Chris Honey and other military hardliners like Spio Yanda wanted to push those Russian tanks into this province and run over the Boers in a military victory. <coughs> but there were doubts led by Oliver Tabu followed by uh, Tabo Mek and others who said, let us talk. We don't want the South Africa to be a Westland. And the talkers, the philosophers of liberation, prevailed. That is why, at the end of the day, South Africa achieved uh, the negotiated settlement, the compromise. That is as a result of the philosophy of liberation that does not believe in it. That is opposed to military victory. That believes in compromises and concessions. Um, they love life in excess, which makes them frequently vulnerable to being killed, especially in war in politics where they are killers. Philosophers of liberation, one of their limitations is that they are innocent at best and very naive at worst. Because they mean no harm, because they are not evil, they think everyone is like. So they very easily get betrayed and undercut by these killers, these monsters, and the business.
They naturally command the great following. And are listened to without question. Even when they are politically wrong. Just like cultic leaders. People like uh, Obama, Tambo, Kenyatta, Nkrumah, just be listened to because Nkrumah said so, then it's so. If you start questioning that, you, you're like, what's happening to you? Whatever we do, what is it that is going to move? <laughs> and that. <clears throat> because of that huge following, they often leave behind many dead supporters, angry followers, and disappointed believers that they failed eventually to protect from animals in the world. You follow this leader and question him. When time comes for you to be protected from monsters and animals in politics, this leader has disarmed you, this leader does not believe in the fighting. You are unprotected and then you become food for justice. Those who massacre others, who poison others, and who kill others in large numbers. Mahatma Gandhi and others. Mahatma Gandhi would tell, uh, I remember great example where he was advising Winston Churchill when there was a threat of uh, Hitler invading Britain. He said, Lie down and let him walk there. Let him take whatever he wants to take. If he wants your house, go out of the house and let him leave. If he intends to massacre you, he will massacre you, massacre you, but that will be his loss. That's liberation thinking. Sacrificial, messianic, and suicidal. And he also gave some advice to the Czechoslovak kids when they were under attack from Paratut as they do. He said, do a naked protest, embarrass them. Uh, go on and strike. <laughs> <laughs> that is the world of liberation thinkers. This was for Pelos Award. If it has to be pound for pound, it must be pound for pound. Because there are snakes and animals in the world. But liberation thinkers are the witness of thinking otherwise. They are messianic po political figures, sacrificial and selfless, and like religious messiahs, they end up at the cross of crucifixion themselves. But they are not crucified physically, they are crucified symbolically. They get humiliated, punished by these animals and snakes and sorcerers that I'm talking about. They are great moralists who are afraid of the stealing that real politics demands, which makes them failed politicians. They don't garner any political interest. They always come second. Because they don't scheme. They are not cunning. They are embarrassed of plotting and all that. They are dreamers and visionaries that see utopia even when there is dystopia. They fantasize instead of strategizing. <laughs> um, I'm talking about the weaknesses of the philosophers of um, liberation. They are highly religious and spiritual figures. Because of their fear of evil and love for salvation, they take the advice of religious and traditional leaders seriously, like gospel. Another, that example of Mahatma Gandhi as well. He was rooted in the traditions of the Hindu and other people in India. He was inspired by those traditions. And those are the traditions that he brought him. <coughs> right, um, just last year, Ikesha U Sipo Maluna presented um, a Joshua Kabo um, commemorative lecture. Which I'm doing here. Uh, what he chose to do was to address the lecture to the common himself, which was a, a great methodological approach of um, addressing the ancestor himself instead of commenting in 
general report. So, in this great lecture, Ike Shaumanu spoke to Nkomo and reported to Nkomo what is happening to his dream, what has happened to the country, and he fought for and reported to Nkomo the tragedies and calamities that have befallen his children. Uh, to continue the conversation from where Manuma left it, I will, together with you, listen to the voice of Nkomo. What did Nkomo say as a philosopher of the country? And I want to remind us that what I just cataloged, what I just presented about the philosophers of liberation, were some of their weaknesses. Their strengths will need us to have two days to talk about them because they are multiple, they are many. So I reflect on the crucifixion of Joshua Gomez, the philosopher of liberation and a great humanist, beyond the myths and fictions of his supporters and detractors. If it did come as far as Zimbabwe, what is happening today in Zimbabwe is the crucifixion of Joshua Gomez. What is happening today is a betrayal of his dreams by a genocidal native uh, colonialist regime. I use um, Gomo's own words as an entry point. So I will get Gomo to talk to us. What did he see? What did he say as a philosopher of liberation? I think there you know, That's where I will answer your fundamental question. What are we here to do? Um, I was luck some years ago that there's a good benefactor, a man called uh, Lindy Cabo, who sent me this copy from the United Kingdom. I had written something and he said, oh, it's death that you have not read the original copy. He Korea did it from London to Pretoria. So what I'm going to say today, most of it comes from here. That's why we are going to pick up the pieces for Joshua Gomez's mind. As a philosopher of liberation, what did he believe in? What did he see? And what did he suggest? I think that helps us to listen uh, to Gomo uh, today. In page three of this book, Joshua Gomo says, From my earliest uh, youth, I tested for freedom, which I call liberation. When I became a man, I understood that I could not be free while my country and its people were subject to a government in which they had no say. That's who speaking about himself. Nobody can deny the sacrifices that Joshua Gomu made for liberation of Zimbabwe. Or can anyone deny that if Gomu prevailed to lead Zimbabwe after independence, we would not have suffered tribalism and as much corruption and looting as we witnessed today. If anything, I'm taking a risk to say, Gomu might have grown up to be a benevolent dictator like Kenneth Kaunia. Loved by people, loving the people, but still a dictator, but trying his best for, for his people. That's another philosopher of liberation, who Kenneth Kaunda. Kenneth Kaunda would rather cry than pick up a person or order police to arrest him for being a dictator. 2000, I went for a research with my friends who were pushing this uh, radio program. I went to, to, to Zambia. And we were very happy now out of that uh, field of we were feeling hungry. We went to a restaurant called Hungry Lion, but they were not serving beef, they were serving chicken. I remember it's the only restaurant where we, we sat at the front and you could hear them slaughtering chickens at the gate and chickens crying. <laughs> I remember that about that chicken. <laughs> and we were like, what are you doing? They said, no, you are eating them fresh, that's why we are giving them any of that. So after that, we then went to Manda Hill. There's a place called Manda Hill, where it's a big mall in there. You might think we're in South Africa. Well, no. The 
research they did there was promotion in, in the digital display area. And what is happening was that I don't know if there was a celebrity. It was going to tell the playing with children. No bodyguard, no what. Loved by the people, loving the people, no one is a grudge against him. After all those years, in power. That's the biggest of our figures. No bloodletting, no killing. We can argue, we can contest the politics, we can do what, but no one will wake up dead tomorrow, no one will be abducted. And such things. Those are the figures of our political issue. Um, Mkomo was such, that is my allegation. I've been, uh, this is another point, point number two. Uh, page, uh, I think, 17. I have been called Father Zimbabwe. Whether I deserve that title is not for me to say. But by a, da a dozen years in prison and half as many in exile, I believe I've earned the right to speak for freedom, liberation, while it is still in danger. This time, not by far of colonial rulers, nor by a settler population who will, I hope, now play their full purpose because of the new nation, but by former colleagues in the liberation struggle. Our war of independence was longer and more cruel than any yet fought in Africa because it was unnecessary. didn't want the war. That is why he left Zipra reluctantly. It was an agony for Mkomo to deploy. <laughs> right, what is Ngomo saying? Should I be called Father Zimbabwe now? I believe this person already have written it before. And please, if you don't like it, open this page so that I can run out. <laughs> Father Zimbabwe is a political nickname that his enemies gave to Paul. While they were busy tribalizing him and reducing him to Father Matebele. There was a time when Joshua Mbom was Father Zimbabwe. But his enemies made sure that he does not become Father Zimbabwe. Mahama Vichela Bante Mashona Lenichi Egelan who support him the day. Support Dani. Abadina Bakudumuni. And those people are mentioned in this um, book. There was a time in 1963. When uh, EOAU, OOEU at the time organized a uh, conference, and Zapu under the leadership of Ngom was invited to make a presentation to other African states how far is the struggle, what is happening, what support do you need, and how can it be assisted? Amas Gaalapa, remember what I'm talking about. Robert Gabriel Mkano was the secretary who was supposed to draft the speech that Ngom was supposed to. And preparations were good, brainstorming a chai caucus to write this point, write this point, if I can just do this. Um, when the conference came, it was this all oh, highly serious, and everyone was there. They wanted to listen to Gomoro, but there was no way to be seen. The speech was not written. And Gomoro later learned to be a political said, no, in front of the OA, you are now elevating this with the You should not be the leader. Majority tribe policy. And when Ukomo was in the middle of that confusion, there was a, a fellow called, um, is it Morton or Norton Mariana? Joseph Musika, who was Ukomo's colleague, because Ukomo was an anti-traditional, he was not tribalist, realized that Mariana was carrying a a suspicious paper. Well, so poly paper they don't see what one they carry in one. Ah, why told I manifest or a grand plan written in black and white that now us as the majority tribe should assume the leadership of this party. Yes. Not this should be there. So they were reducing this person from Father Zimbabwe to. Father Matebele. That's why in my analysis I'm saying 
They were lying to him that you are part of Zimbabwe. They were busy organizing China and all of that. So Nkomo's enemies had become native colonialists. While Seka colonialists used racism, they were now using tribalism. Up to today, Zimbabwe has not recovered from that evil, which was cultivated by certain politicians because of power and all that. Right. Uh, point number three. This is another statement from uh, Joshua Mbogo. Hardly any family in our country was unaffected by the bloody war that was forced upon us. Again, forced upon us. Nkomo was a reluctant commander. He didn't want to go to war. Um, but nothing in my life had prepared me for persecution at the hands of the government led by great Africans. That's another problem with the philosophy of liberation. How can you say in 1984 nothing prepared you that these people are going to persecute you. When in 1963 they split from you on tribal grounds and called you Zimbabwe, you forgot all that. How can you say nothing prepared you when 1972-1976 Zipra was slaughtered in Gagao and Morogoro? How can you say you didn't see this coming? That's who they are, these philosophers of liberation. They believe in the holiness of others. And that people are going to change for the better. When in politics, if you read Machiavelli and other political views, Machiavelli says human beings are either good or bad. But for purposes of politics, assume they are bad and act like they are bad. But here is Gomo in 1984 saying, Benin Awazu was But in 1963, you are not a majority tribe. Tumuguru. But still, look, nothing prepared me for this crucifixion. Uda, Chamber of Zita, Owe Flavangan. So, Komo, like any other philosopher of liberation, was uh, reluctant about war. His hesitation irritated and exposed his soldiers and followers to danger. Everything should have prepared Komo for persecution by Zanpia, well from 1963. That is on record as a fact that tribalism, hatred, and evil was mobilized to reduce so called Father Zimbabwe to father of a certain village, Samu. Go to the local table and go until the end. Point number four. Um, in all my dealings with people, this is Goma speaking, I have acted trustingly. And they found out too late when I've been betrayed. My comfort has been to trust in and be trusted by the masses. And true to his words, he acted trustingly with snakes, sorcerers, murderers, and killers. And in the process, did not get betrayed personally. He exposed an entire population of the Zapu supporters who have got the very and shown I involved and exposed former Zipra cutters to mass murder and to violence that people have still not recovered from up to today because Uko moderated trustingly, even trustingly with snakes, ISRs putting a mass snakes. Indeed, Uko more trusted more than he should have, especially looking at the sorcerers that surrounded him. Trusting in the masses and being trusted by them is not enough if the leaders do not protect them from sorcerers. When you lead people politically, you must have the capacity to protect them. That's why Zebra was created. But we did not utilize Zip when it was needed. Wafana Vivadi Pansi's car, Sikuru, Zabe, Wawet Zedan. Abad said it is armed with the mobilized Vesimaka and the land of the Bula. There's one person, or is it Colonel Dyke, who said, if someone gave me an army like Zipra, yeah, Peter Watson, and this one, eh, Angola, 
I can march from Cape to Cairo without a pop step. There was no military machine, military instrument that was exported as zip. But there was no command. The generals that were there were what was told.